worship here this morning. We still have a few people coming in, and that's okay. Take your time and find a place to sit. Uh, but while we're uh, coming in, uh, just a good reminder here. You, t you hear us talk about our Bible reading plan here quite a bit. Uh, and if you're not part of our Bible reading plan, this would be an excellent time for you to become part of our Bible reading plan. We're only a week into, a, into the year. Uh, there's still plenty of time for you to become part of it. If you want to, you just go to the website. It's unfadingtruth.org. Uh, or you can talk to me and just tell me, yes, I'd like to be part of it. And here's, uh, I'd like to have a text message or an email, whatever works the best for you. Uh, don't miss out on that. It's really quite important for you to be reading the Bible every day. Uh, because one of the things that you'll notice is that many of the passages that we use here on a weekly basis are going to be an echo of what we've read together in this past week. And such is the case today. Our call to worship comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. This is something that God's people have been called into worship with now for thousands of years. Since the Israelites were in the desert with Moses... This call to worship was given to them. It's called the Shema because of the first two words. Shema Israel. Hear, O Israel. And it's given to us here this morning. Hear, O Israel. Hear, O people of God. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. So with that in mind, let's come before him in a time of silent prayer, asking that he will prepare our hearts to worship him. As we begin our worship by singing praises to him, the song that we sing is one that we've sung a couple of months ago now. You, you might remember it. There are no notes on the page with this one, and I know you like that, but I couldn't find it for this particular song. But if you don't remember it from a couple of months ago, it's only going to take you a few measures to get it figured out. It's a, it's a fast-moving song and one that's fun to sing, but one that emphasizes the oneness of our triune God. So stand with the music and let's sing This Is Our God.
we wait for our God to greet us here this morning, he's called us into this place, and now he welcomes us here. We're going to continue from what we've read this past week, and Psalm 90 begins with a prayer here, and so you and I are going to pray this prayer together. You can do so by soaking in the words as you see them, or closing your eyes and bowing your head, whatever you'd like to do, but let's pray to our Lord as he greets us here this morning. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And this everlasting God welcomes you into his presence here this morning. He says to you, grace, mercy, and peace be yours from our one God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I'll turn and greet those who are with you this morning. continue worshiping God here by singing a version of Psalm 90. Praise to the Lord the Almighty. We'll sing all four verses. <laughs> You may be seated. Congregation of Jesus Christ, today we celebrate God's gift of faithful leadership for his people. We joyfully thank him for elders and deacons who have served well and who have completed their terms of office. Our outgoing elders are Steve Robinson and Mike Bousma. Elders serve by governing the church in Christ's name. They received this task when Christ entrusted the apostles and their successors with the keys of the kingdom of heaven. 
Elders are thus responsible for the spiritual well-being of God's people. They must provide true preaching and teaching, regular celebration of the sacraments and faithful counsel and discipline, all while keeping in confidence those matters entrusted to them. And they must promote fellowship and hospitality among believers, ensure good order within the church, and stimulate witness to all people. Our outgoing deacons are Dallas Ransom and Mitchell Gravenhoff. And I'm going to pause there for a moment because all of our elders and deacons in this church work hard at the roles that they've been given. But there's one who works particularly hard for us all throughout the year. And that's our treasurer who happened to be Dallas Ransom for the last few years. And there are several good treasurers before him who have all been working uh, very hard along with Lorraine to streamline our finances here and, and so that we can do it all in house. We don't have to ship it out to an accountant anymore. So thank all of the men who have been serving, but, but give an extra pat on the back to Dallas for the work that he's done on our behalf here this morning as well. Deacons serve by showing mercy to the church and to all people. They received this task in the early church when the apostles designated special persons for the work of mercy. In Christ's name, the deacons relieve victims of injustice. By this, they show that Christians live by the spirit of the kingdom, fervently desiring to give life the shape of things to come. Deacons are therefore called to assess needs, promote stewardship and hospitality, collect and disperse resources for benevolence, and develop programs of assistance. They are also called to speak words of Christian encouragement. Thus, in word as well as deed, they demonstrate the care of the Lord himself. These tasks of elders and deacons call for believers who are Christ-like, who are mature in the faith, and who exercise their offices with prayer and patience and humility. So we praise God for providing their successors. And we now intend to ordain elders and deacons and to install them for terms of service here in this congregation. Those appointed to the office of elder are David Bosma and Kirk Skelhaas. And those appointed to the office of deacon are Austin Vandekamp and Ken Vanderby. I'll pause here one more time. I've had numerous questions since Ken was nominated for the office of deacon because we all know that he's served so well in the past uh, as an elder. Uh, and we have to get past this idea that we have that somehow the deacons are the JV team and the elders are the varsity team. That's not the case. And it's specifically because of the wisdom that, that Ken has demonstrated to us as an elder in this church that we have nominated him to be a deacon because that is needed as well. To express your acceptance of these offices, I'd ask these men to stand. Actually, we're going to have you come all the way up to the front here and stand here in the presence of God in this church, and we have a couple of questions for you to answer. So, men, if you could please come up here. And I'll kind of stand right there in the middle. First of all, you're working for them. So let's turn around and have you look at them. You'll be able to hear everything that I'm asking to you. And, and uh, I'm going to ask you these four questions, and then I'll go through you one by one and ask uh, for your response. First of all, do you believe that in the call of this congregation, God himself, is calling you to these holy offices. Second, do you believe that the Old and New Testaments are the word of God, the only infallible rule of faith and life? Third, do you subscribe to the doctrinal standards of this church, rejecting all teaching which contradicts them? And then finally, do you promise to do the work of your offices faithfully in a way worthy of your calling and in submission to the government and to the discipline of this church. Ken Vanderveen, what is your answer? I do God help. Kirk Skelhaas. I do God help. 
David Bosma and Austin Vandekamp. I'm going to have all of the council members come up now and pray with these men. Uh, so as council members, as you come up with the ones who are just retiring now and the ones who will continue to serve, bring your Psalter hymnal with you so that we can use it in a moment. Let's pray. God, our Heavenly Father, who has called you to these sacred offices, may he guide you by his word. May he equip you with his spirit. And so prosper your ministries that his church may increase and his name be praised. Amen. And I give a charge to you as elders now, and then I'll give a charge to the deacons. I charge you elders to guard yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Be a friend and Christ-like example to children. Give clear and cheerful guidance to young people. By word and example, bear up God's people in their pain and weakness and celebrate their joys with them. Hold in trust all sensitive matters confided to you. Encourage the aged to persevere in God's promises. Be wise counselors who support and strengthen the pastor. Be compassionate and yet firm and consistent in rebuke and discipline. Know the scriptures which are useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training up in righteousness so that you can hold firmly to sound doctrine. Pray continually for the church. Remember at all times that if you would truly give spiritual leadership in the household of faith, you yourself must be completely mastered by your Lord. And now deacons. I charge you deacons to inspire faithful stewardship in this congregation. Remind us that from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. Teach us to be merciful. Prompt us to seize new opportunities to worship God with offerings of wealth, time, and ability. Realize that benevolence is a quality of our life in Christ and not merely a matter of financial assistance. Therefore, minister to rich and poor alike, both within and outside of the church. Weigh the needs of causes and use the church's resources discerningly. Be compassionate to the needy. Respect their need for dignity. Hold in trust all sensitive matters confided to you. Encourage them with words that create hope in their hearts and with deeds that bring joy into their lives. Be prophetic critics of waste, injustice, and selfishness within our society. And be sensitive counselors to the victims of such evils. Let your lives be above reproach. Live as examples of Christ Jesus and look to the interests of others. Now I'm going to have the congregation rise because you play a role in this as well. <coughs> I charge you, the people of God, to receive these men as Christ's gift to the church. Recognize in them the Lord's provision for a healthy congregational life. Hold them in honor. Take their counsel seriously. Respond to them with obedience and respect. Accept their help with thanks. Sustain them in prayer. Encourage them with your support, especially when they feel the burden of their office. Acknowledge them as the Lord's servants among you. And now I have a question for you. Do you, as the congregation, pledge to receive these men as you have been charged? Congregation, what is your answer? We do. God helping us.
Well, now we get the opportunity as elders and deacons. This is something that we do every year. I'll have you continue to stand. Uh, we're going to sing song, uh, I Love Your Church, O Lord. It's number 510, guys, in the, um, in the Psalter hymnals that you brought up. The, all of the verses will be on the screen. But for the first two verses, it's just going to be us men up here singing. And they assured me that they were going to sing loud. We looked at it and, uh, to practice it here a minute ago. And the first thing that they asked me what all the dots were on the page. So I don't know how this will go, but I think we'll do all right. Uh, 510, we're going to sing all three verses. The first two, the men up here will sing. Uh, and then you guys as a congregation are going to join us on verse 3. are going to go sit down and the little children are going to come up. You may be seated as well. Uh, we're going to combine our congregational prayer here this morning uh, and our prayer with the children. We're going to do that for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, because we're short on time here this morning. Uh, and secondly, because we're going to be actually praying, especially for a couple of children in our congregation. It would be good to have their friends up here with them. Uh, right now, Graham Kruger is in the hospital in Sioux Falls with RSV. His sister Layton uh, is no longer in the hospital, but she had her tonsils out earlier this week. Uh, and so she's recovering from that. Uh, and from what I understand, there's not a, just a lot of children who are sick right now, uh, but there's a lot of people in general who are sick this week with COVID and RSV and colds and flu and all of the other things that tend to go around at this time of the year. So let's pray especially for, for Graham and Layton this morning and our congregation in general. Father in heaven, we do thank you that even these children can come to you in prayer for one another and in prayer for this congregation. Father, we pray especially for little Graham this morning as he's in the hospital in Sioux Falls. We pray that he finds relief from the congestion of the RSV that he has and that he'll be able to breathe well once again. We pray for his sister Layton as she recovers from having her tonsils out earlier in this week. And may that be a quick recovery for her. Father, there are many of our friends and family members who either have been sick in this past week or are sick right now. And so we pray for your hand of healing upon all of us. Thank you for these men who were up here just a moment ago and for the commitment that they have uh, given to your church. And we thank you for these little children who are here now, who are eager to continue learning about you and about what you have done for us. All this we pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. Alrighty, guys, have a good, have a good morning. And, and our deacons are going to come forward now and, uh, with our collection for this morning. I believe it's for Covet this morning. Yeah, Covenant Education. That's how we pool our money together so that kids in this church can have Christian education.
my people go. Isn't it amazing how God always uses the offertory? I don't know what it's going to be until I sit and listen to it with you. But somehow it ties in with the words that God has given us here this morning. Do you remember why it was that God said to Moses, go tell Pharaoh, let my people go? It was so that they could worship me upon this mountain. And that's what he still calls us to do, to worship him. So stand with the music and let's give him that worship that he deserves as we prepare to hear God's word. We're going to sing two verses, not three, two verses of Seek Ye First the Kingdom of God. probably got some plans made for this coming week, right? It's already been mentioned here a couple of times this morning. Yeah, here we are back at it again. Sunday school started once again. School's already going. It started back on Wednesday for most of the students. Uh, work for some of you, you're like, well, I didn't even realize we had a break over the last couple of weeks. Nothing changed for me. Uh, some of you uh, have Retired, right? And so maybe you've got some hobbies that you're going to work on, or probably more the case, you've got appointments that you need to keep uh, at the doctor in this coming week. The question is not what are you going to do this week. That question has already been answered for you, probably. The question is why are you doing the things that you are going to do this week? Why? Well, many of us who are working say we got to pay the bills. We need money, right? And that's not wrong. That's just a fact of life. Others of you have work to do that's just been given to you. Some of the students will identify with that. I'm not asking for all of this work, but yet mom and dad put me in this classroom anyway. Some of you on the farm have work to do regardless of whether it makes you money or not. The work has to be done, doesn't it? Uh, and again, maybe you're retired or maybe you're sick and you can't do any work. You can't even do the things that you like to do. And so the thought begins to be then, well, what am I even here for in the first place if I've got nothing that I'm actually adding to society? We're right back here to the Sermon on the Mount once again. That's where we were about a month ago when we stepped away to go to Luke's Gospel for a while. And that means you're going to be opening your Bibles to a spot that they were open to quite a bit over the last couple of months as we jump back into Jesus' teaching for us here. We're up to chapter 6, verse 19 today. That's on page 1,504. And so as we read this text here together this morning, understand that this text is going to change nothing in the what you have to do this week category. That's going to remain the same. But I think that this text is going to have a huge impact on why it is that you're doing what you're doing in this coming week. Because if you understand that why aspect well, well, then it's going to help you with the how you do what you have to do this week as well. So let's read these words from our Savior Jesus, picking up right where we left them off in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Hear now the word of the Lord. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, 
there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great that darkness. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Let's thank God for these words and pray that he'll help us to understand them. Father, it's good to come back to your word once again. Our lives are busy. And as we begin to think about that list of things that needs to be accomplished in this coming week, it's overwhelming for most of us. And so it's good to just be able to put that list away for a few minutes and quietly concentrate on these words that our Savior spoke to us. For these words, especially that we're reading here today, have eternal significance for us. And so bless them to us. Help us to understand them the way that you would have us understand them. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to move through this first point quite quickly. Number one, because it's depressing. And number two, because regardless of your experience with the Christian life, you get this already. You get the depressing reality of life that nothing here is going to last. That's exactly what Jesus tells us here. Do not treasure things up where moths and this newer version puts vermin destroy. Uh, your older version there says rust. What it's after is things that nibble away at something the way that rust nibbles away at something or that mice nibble away at something. Thieves break in and steal. Again, this isn't news to you. You understand this, right? Every piece of equipment that you bought new at one point in time, it so quickly wears out and it's not new anymore. Even the clothes that you wear wear out and they don't look the way that they looked when you bought it. Even our own bodies, this happens to, right? And the older we get, the more we realize our inabilities to do things that we did not or that we used to be able to do. And this morning, we, we looked at in Sunday school the fact that you and I were formed from the dust of the ground, at least in our father Adam. That's how God created Adam, differently than what he created the other things. He carefully formed Adam from the dust of the ground. But then in several spots elsewhere through Scripture, we read that because of sin, that dust is going back to the ground. You and I, all of us who are sitting in here, if the Lord doesn't return, that's where we're going to be is back in the ground. That's why I love these old churches around here, especially country churches that, that have the cemeteries right there on the churchyard. I, I think that's, that's awesome because as you come into God's house then every week, you have this weekly reminder that there will come a day when you're six foot down in that hole as well. It's going to happen to all of us. Things don't last. But Jesus wants us to understand more than just this basic understanding here this morning. More than just stuff is being talked about here in this passage by our Savior. What he is saying is that anything that stops with life in this world is coming to an end. And don't put your treasure in it. What does he mean by that? Well, not just the stuff that you're accumulating. He means the accomplishments that you're going after, the awards that you covet so badly, even the championships that we win and all of the work that goes into it. Some of the most fascinating biographies that you can read are by people who have climbed the highest mountain in their specific sport, have gotten the biggest championship that they can get, and what that's like psychologically for them afterwards when they find out that there's not as much there as what they thought and that it's going away. If what we're talking about here is more than just stuff, more than just even our accomplishments, it's everything that's going to end with this world, then we have to understand that, that not only our stuff is included here, but our relationships and our memories that we work so hard to form. Well, 
moth and rust will destroy that. Thieves will break in and steal them. Even congregations like ours. Oh, we have the promise in Scripture for sure that the church, with a capital C church, the church will prevail to the end and not even the gates of hell can stand against it. That is a rock-solid promise, but we're not given that promise for each individual congregation. Right? Congregations are going to fade out over time. We're seeing this even within our community now. And even if, by God's grace, we continue to thrive here in this congregation, the day will come when our Savior returns and makes this particular place here obsolete. We won't need to come here anymore to meet with God, uh, for we will be in God's presence all the time. Even the church, then, is included in what Jesus is talking about here. Nothing here will last. Now, let's not push this point too far. Jesus is not saying here that stuff does not matter. It certainly does. You need a roof over your head. You needed four wheels to get you here this morning. You need to be wearing clothes. Please continue to do that. It's good for you to work on winning championships and awards and accomplishments. And certainly it's good for you to build up relationships. And please continue to work to build up this church. These things are good things, aren't they? Jesus is not calling us away from doing these things. Here's what he's saying in verse 19. Notice these words look different than the ones that you have in your Bible. The one in your Bible is a good translation of it. Uh, this is a more literal translation. And, and the reason that your Bible doesn't say, do not treasure up for yourself treasures on earth is because that's terrible English, right? In English, we can't turn... Uh, a, a noun into a verb. But they can in Greek. And so that's the way that Jesus said it. He, he used the same word and just changed the ending there to make it from a noun into a verb. So this is what he has in mind. It's not just storing things up. It's treasuring things in our hearts. Treasures on earth. This is what he's warning us against here. This stuff has value. These things that we just talked about, of course it has value. But it's a temporary value. It's a value that will come to an end. And really, this is a theme not just of Jesus. This is a theme throughout all of Scripture, especially in a book like Ecclesiastes. And that theme goes this way. Enjoy the voyage that you're on, but understand that the ship is going to sink. Right? It's the way that we might understand the voyage of the Titanic, that it was, it was really good up until the last couple hours. That's what we're in here in this life. Enjoy it while it lasts. That, that command is given to us over and over throughout the Bible to enjoy the good things that God has given to us, but understand it is coming to an end. Understand that the ship is going to sink. So we've been able to move through this quickly, knowing that nothing here is going to last. That doesn't mean that stuff doesn't matter. But, but here's why this is important. It's because what you treasure, what you give the most value to in your life, that determines your trajectory in life, the direction that you go, and even the speed that you're going as you head there. Let's find out why. Verse 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You see how treasure is magnetic? How it pulls you towards it? Right? You get this already. You've experienced this in your life. Uh, the things that you want the most tend to be pulling you in that direction. They become self-fulfilling prophecies in a sense. If you really, really want that championship... Chances are, if you have the right talent, you're going to get drawn towards it. You're going to do the kind of things that you need to do in order to attain it. And we can say that not just about championships, but really about anything. This is a fundamental fact of humanity. This is something that we all need to understand, Christian or not Christian, is that what you want the most, what you want the most, drives the way that you think, it drives the way that you feel or your emotions, and it drives then what you do. It really becomes all-encompassing. 
It's magnetic. It, it forms our worldview here even when we understand that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus goes on to, to compare it to our eyes here. The eye is the lamp of the body and when your eyes are healthy, your whole body is full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of dark. <coughs> Right? You're, it's not talking physically about your eyesight here, of course. We understand that there's something more going on here. Kids, you'll even understand this because every single one of us who's ever played any sort of sport in our life has been told one thing over and over and over. Keep your eye on the ball. Right? Because your parents and your coaches understand that there's just something magnetic about your eyes. And when you keep your eye on that ball, your hand will automatically go where it needs to go to catch it or to hit it or to do whatever you need to do. If you keep your eye on the ball, guess what? The rest of your body is just going to follow along with it. Now, mine doesn't do that very much. The rest of my body, for whatever reason, doesn't like to listen to my eyes. I don't know why that is. Maybe you've experienced that as well. But we get the concept here, right? That we do what we have our eyes fixed on. Notice here the holistic effects of this. We're not just talking about our spiritual lives that are being affected by this doctrine here this morning. We've already talked about this in Sunday school this morning. That is, human beings, we have a physical aspect to us for sure and a spiritual aspect. Both of them are just as real and both of them are just as important. But you can see how Jesus here is combining the two of them. Uh, in this physical reality that if, you, uh, if your eyes are locked on healthy treasure, well, guess what? Your whole body is going to be full of light. In other words, what you believe and know to be true and what you have your eyes fixed on so that your life is going in that trajectory will have benefits for you, not just in your spiritual life, but in your physical life as well. This is very holistic. That's why theology matters, doesn't it? Understanding what we believe, understanding the direction that we go and why we're going in that direction, it's really the most practical thing that we could come to understand. It's not just something that's far off and, and for the books. Understand here, it's not just what you're doing, but why you're doing it. Right? Again, we talked about the fact that nothing's going to change what you have to do this week. You have to do what you have to do. Right? The question is, is, why are we doing these things that we have to do? Because if it's just earthly treasure that you're after, just the stuff that this world can give to you, whether that's the abundance of things, whether it's the relationships that you have with other people, uh, or even if it's just memories that you're trying to build up, over the course of your life. If, if, if those are the only things that you're after, well, enjoy the voyage. There's a lot of nice stuff out there to have. <clears throat> oh, there's a lot of value in relationships that you have with other people. It's, it's worth building them up. And certainly the memories that you have, there will come a day when, when the memories are all that you have, but yet they too will come to an end. We want something deeper than this, don't we? But on the other hand, if treasuring God, that is if wanting God, wanting it in the deepest way possible, well, you're still going to need some stuff, right? We've already determined that our stuff isn't bad. We need to have it. But see, if we, if we listen to Jesus here, here's, here's what we're going to find out. We're going to find out that as we do these temporal things that you need to do in this coming week, as you do those temporal things... You're going to do them in a way that has lasting, eternal significance. As you do these things, then, with your treasure set in the correct spot, you're going to be growing as a disciple even as you do the things that you have to do. And ultimately, you're going to be fulfilling your eternal purpose, the reason that you were created, the reason that God took the dust of the ground and formed it into a man and put his breath into him was that so Adam, so that you and I could know God. That's the purpose that we were created for. 
So this is a depressing reality, isn't it? That nothing here will last. Doesn't mean that the stuff doesn't matter. It does. But what we're understanding here is, is what we have our eyes set on. That's going to determine our trajectory in life. So it's quite important that we get that right. So after looking at that depressing reality, let's now understand something much better here. The motivating promise that Jesus gives to us in this passage. Well, that promise is that you have been made a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. What a tremendous promise this is. And that's not just something that we get from today's passage alone, isn't it? This is something that we've been reading throughout the Sermon on the Mount. Remember, we keep going back to chapter 4, verse 17. We, we did the last time we were on these passages, and we're going to be doing so again moving forward. We can't understand any of Jesus' practical instruction unless we first understand these foundational verses. And that foundational verse is what he says here. Repent. Remember what that means, metanoia? To change your thinking. Change your thinking, Jesus says. For the kingdom of heaven has come near, and you have been made a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. That's what the angel armies came to announce to the, to the shepherds, wasn't it? Gloria and excelsius Deo, because the kingdom of heaven has come down, and you have been made part of it. That's the good news of Christianity. Jesus goes on to mention our citizenship of the kingdom of heaven in the Beatitudes here. He starts off with it. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Because what do they get? Oh, they get the kingdom of heaven. What Jesus is saying there is when you acknowledge your spiritual bankruptcy, when you acknowledge that away from Jesus Christ and away from God our Father and away from the Holy Spirit, you're just dust. There's nothing else left. You're poor in spirit and you long, you hunger and you thirst for that spiritual connection once again. That's what Jesus is talking about here when he says poor in spirit. When you acknowledge that you're unable to gain eternal treasure on your own and that you're utterly dependent upon God, you will be given the kingdom of heaven. What a promise. And he caps off. The, the, the Beatitudes with the same reward here. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, when you stand up for what it is that you believe, regardless of what's pushing against you, you're going to be welcomed into the kingdom of heaven. You've been made a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. That's what the gospel is, isn't it? The gospel is just simply, well, let's, let's talk about what it's not first. The gospel is not making sure that you treasure up enough of the right treasure. Let me say that again, because so many Christians are falling into that trap. The gospel is not making sure that you're treasuring up the right kind of treasure. As if you've been going after the wrong treasure last week and the week before and all of your life. And that things will just be much better for you if you go after the right treasure. Now, that's true. Things will be better for you if you go after the right treasure. But that's not what the gospel is. The gospel is that you have already been made a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. You are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone. And this is good news. Because we're natural treasure seekers. It's hardwired into us. We can't help but not do it. There are none of you out here today. And no matter how far we spread our, our net out, we would not find anybody who can say, oh, no, not me. I'm not after some sort of treasure. We all are. And so this good news that we've been made citizens of the kingdom of heaven means that you are not relegated to just wasting your time, wasting your life, collecting treasure that will not last. That's the tremendous good news today. Be sure to know this good news, that you're not just after better treasure. No, the gospel brings complete and total peace to your life. The shalom that the Israelites wanted so badly, the shalom that you want so badly 
is what the gospel brings to you. You've been made a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. The question here is, what kind of citizen do you want to be? You've been made a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. What kind of citizen do you really want to be? I'm going to drop to my thing. What kind of, there's a continuum here. Let's go back to chapter 5, verse 19. This is just uh, really a chapter or so ahead of where we're at now today. Uh, but these are familiar words to us here. Jesus says, anyone who sets aside the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands here will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Do you see what's going on here? There's a continuum. There are some people who are the least, and there are some who will be great. Which one do you want? Do you want to be the least, or do you want to be the great? That's really a question that you need to answer right here and right now. Because it changes the way that we understand here what Jesus is saying to us. When we look at this command that he's given to you. Verse 20 is not a suggestion. It's a command. He's telling you to treasure up for yourselves, to store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Again, it's not just a good idea. This is something our Savior commands us to do because these treasures will last forever. Moth and vermin and rust will not destroy. Thieves will not break in and steal. Uh, Peter talks about this everlasting inheritance is the way that he puts it in his first letter. He says that it will never perish, spoil, or fade. That's the inheritance that you and I have waiting for us as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And let's go back to that benefit that we get here and now. If your eyes are healthy, if you're going after this treasure that you've been commanded to go after, well, guess what? Your whole body will be healthy. This will have ramifications throughout your entire life. Interesting uh, illustration here. And, and I was looking through my notes. I, I last preached on this passage in 2018 in Washington. And we talked about Jeff Bezos then. You know who Jeff Bezos is, right? I had to change, even in, those, even in these five or six years, I had to change who this illustration is about because we don't hear much about Jeff Bezos anymore. He, of course, is the CEO of Amazon. Huge, huge company. <coughs> Now, I guess the one that we would look to as the, as the big wig in this country, or really, or even the world, would be Elon Musk, right? Or maybe you're thinking of somebody else who's, who's just incredibly wealthy uh, and can do whatever they want to do uh, and have a knack for making money out of nothing, right? That's who these guys are. Let's say Elon or Jeff Bezos, whoever you want it to be, they come up to you one day. I mean, yeah, we're, this is totally hypothetical, but, but just, just kind of play along with us here. They said, I, I've got this great idea for a brand new company. This is going to be bigger than Tesla. It's going to be bigger than SpaceX. It's going to be bigger than Amazon. It's going to be bigger than anything. This is going to be amazing. Billions and trillions of dollars are going to be made from it. I want you to be part of this company. I want you in, Elon says to you. Now, obviously, none of us deserve that sort of inclusion here. None of us are that smart that we have something to offer to Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos or whoever it is that would add value to what he wants to do. He says, I'm going to make you an employee of this company and I'm going to give you stock options, which are how you make gazillions of dollars in life through <coughs> stock options. And I'm going to give that to you. It's secure. Nothing can take it from you, Elon says to you. But here's the thing. The harder you work for me, Elon says, the more I'll richly increase your share of the company. You see that? The harder you work, the more of the company, this, this invaluable company, I will give to you. Now, let me ask you a question. If you were offered that deal, how hard would you work? Would you put in an hour and a half or two hours a week and call it good? <laughs> Probably not. Right? You'd be all in on that. You'd get rid of whatever else is dragging you down in this world that you've been doing, and you'd focus on this valuable work that's been placed in front of you. 
Now, maybe you see where we're going with this. Forget about Elon Musk. Forget about Jeff Bezos. Jesus Christ has come into your life. The kingdom of God has come near to you. He has made you a citizen. And this is by pure grace alone that he did it. You didn't deserve that. But you're in. And your position is secure. It can never be taken away from you. And he says to you here this morning, the more you treasure me, the greater your reward will be in eternity. What a deal. Now the question comes to you. How hard are you going to work? An hour and a half or two hours a week? Or do you want to be all in? We want to be all in on this. Forget about some billion dollar company. This is worth way more than that. We want to be people who take this motivating promise and then aggressively invest in it. Aggressively invest in this reward. The first thing that you need to understand about it is it's not passive income. Maybe some of you make passive income in your life. You have property that you rent out or, or stocks that you just get dividends from or something like that. You don't have to do anything in order to get the, the reward from it, right? It's, it's a real thing. It's passive income. That's not what we're talking about here. That's not how this reward from the kingdom of heaven works. It's hard work, Jesus says. Treasure this up. Treasure up for yourself treasures in heaven. This is real work. It's hard work. It's consuming work to do it well. I like the way that theologian Herman Bobbink, he's one of my favorites. I like the way he puts it here. He says the kingdom of God is a gift. It is a gift. You can have this gift right now. It's by grace alone that, that you've been granted. This kingdom has been granted to you by God according to his good pleasure, not because of something that you and I <coughs> did to deserve it, right? We understand this. But Bobby goes on. Not only, there's some tension here now, not only is the kingdom of God a gift granted by God's grace, it's also a reward, a treasure in heaven. Those are the very words that Jesus is speaking to us now. The kingdom of God is both of these things at once. It's a gift of grace and it's a reward. A wage. It's a treasure that you work for. Both of these things are true at the same time. That's the beauty of Reformed theology as we follow the Bible. Sometimes it pulls us in two different directions. That doesn't mean that just this side is true and we got to go that way, or just this side is true and we got to go that way. Both of these things are true all at once. It's a gift and it's a reward. Since it's both of those things, not only do you give it, get it granted to you as you already have, you must aggressively seek after it and gain it by labor in the service of God. You see that here? It is a gift. It's a gift that any one of you can freely receive from God through his Holy Spirit who's already prepared your heart for it. It comes to you at no cost. It comes to you because of nothing that you've done yourself. But once the gift has been given to you, oh, there's work to do. You've got to aggressively seek after it and gain it by labor. Now this idea here that Bobbink is, is kind of putting into words for us is called... The Protestant work ethic. Maybe you've heard that term before in, in your history classes back in school. They probably don't talk about it very much anymore. The Protestant work ethic. And it's really what separated Western civilization. And, and really especially North America from the rest of the world. Because throughout the ages here, at least in the history of our country, people got this. That they're at the same time saved by grace, but yet they have to aggressively work hard. Not only to get the stuff that we need in this world, but because as we work hard here, we're going to see that we're building up treasure in heaven. And so that's driven us to do great things, especially here in North America. Now it's happening really more in the rest of the world than what is happening here. It's now taking hold in Africa. And that's awesome to see, isn't it? As, as we let go of it here, they're, they're grabbing onto it and saying, yeah, this is the way we want to build our civilization as well. See, that's the tremendous opportunity that you and I have here in this 
particular church in this particular place is that there's an entire community out there that has no idea of the blessings that come from the Protestant work ethic. And, and you and I get to share that with them as we build this community up together. What a privilege that is. You know, this is not passive income. This is hard work, but we're hardworking kind of people, right? We've been brought up in this, so to speak. No matter how long you've been here, you, you, you get how this works. So let's look at a few of the ways that we can invest in this and do so aggressively. First of all, treasure what Jesus treasures. Tre treasure what Jesus treasures. Now be careful here. Jesus isn't saying to us here this morning, just treasure me a little bit more than what you have before. I know you've been treasuring mammon. That's that final word in this sentence. It's translated money in the NIV, mammon. You've heard that before. Just take a little bit of the treasure away from mammon. Give me a little bit more. That's not at all what Jesus is saying to us here. Here's verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Now, it's very important the way they translated that word, masters. They did not translate it, no one can serve two employers. Many of you do that, sometimes two, three, or even four employers <laughs> that you got to keep happy. That's not what's going on here. Masters is a word that's typically affiliated with slavery, isn't it? That's what's being talked about here. If you're a slave, you have one master. Now, your master may put you to work for somebody else, but you're still working for the one master. That's what's being said here. You can't serve two masters. You serve one master. Either you're going to hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. That word mammon is uh, an Aramaic word. Uh, that's best left untranslated. It's just what it is. It's, it's, not, it's just the idea of gaining stuff. That's what mammon is. And we're not saying that money is bad. That's not what Jesus is saying. He's just saying, when that becomes your goal, then it's mammon to you. Again, look at another theologian here who said it better than what I can. Both God and money here are being portrayed not as employers, but as slave owners. Either God is served with single-eyed devotion, or he's not served at all. You see that. Either you're keyed in on your master Jesus, or you're not keyed in on him at all. You're not doing anything for him. It's, it's, it's a zero-sum game here. It's, it's all in on Jesus, or you're not in on him at all. You see, attempts at divided loyalty, they're not just a partial commitment to discipleship. But it's deep-seated commitment to idolatry. Right? And this is where so many of us are. We've got some of our eggs in this basket over here in mammon because we need some mammon in our lives. And then we got some of our eggs in this basket and treasures in heaven because we know that we have this eternal life. But yet we're not quite willing to give up our eggs over here. We're not even, and what Jesus is calling us to do is not just take another egg from there and put it over here on this side until you only have a few eggs over here and most of your eggs over there. Not at all what we're being called to here. Now understand that the Sermon on the Mount is a guidebook for citizens of the kingdom of heaven. That's what you and I are, right? It's not a punch list of do's and don'ts. You notice the difference here between the Ten Commandments and the Beatitudes, for example, or really the Sermon on the Mount as, as a whole? It's very hard here in the Sermon on the Mount to get specific things out of it, right? It's a guidebook, not just a punch list. Again, Jesus is looking for full, holistic, full mind and body and soul, all of you, all of you being aligned here on one thing. Let's go back and remind ourselves what is going on here. We're changing our thinking because the kingdom of heaven is near. Okay, so your belief is being, is being grounded in the kingdom of heaven. That 
turns your thinking to being grounded in the kingdom of heaven. That affects then your emotions. In the Beatitudes, Jesus says here, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Do you see that? How emotionally based that is. That every aspect of you, we read something of it similar in Psalm 90 earlier this week. That my heart and soul, this is Psalm 84, sorry, my heart and soul long for you. They yearn for you. We hunger and thirst for righteousness. We're emotionally invested in the kingdom of heaven. And in its Indicated in our actions. Our actions as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, which we were made not out of our own accord, but by God's grace, enable us to live in a way where our righteousness surpasses anyone's because of the Holy Spirit who is in us. So our mind is involved. We're changing our thinking. Our emotions are involved. We're hungering and thirsting for the kingdom of God. Uh, and then our volition, our will, follows along, and our righteousness then surpasses that of everyone else. Right? So here's how we aggressively invest in our reward. We treasure what Christ treasures. Now, the next one and the final one. Use your treasure to serve him. Now, I looked at that sermon that I gave in 2018 when, when I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> As I looked at that, I would not preach that sermon again because I had on there a couple of pages of ways, of things that you could do. Go out there and serve the kingdom of heaven because there's all sorts of opportunities for you to do that, aren't there? And what I ended up doing to those people, maybe it's what God needed God needed to have them hear that at the time. I don't know. I, 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 I'm not giving you that list right now. You don't need something else to do, do you? You're already too busy as it is. So I have all of those suggestions, but we're not going to go over them because I think it's missing the point here. There are so many people, so many Christians, in fact, that are doing lots of good things. The things that seem like they're, they're doing it for the kingdom of heaven, they're doing lots of good things, but in doing those good things, they're not storing up even a shekel's worth of treasure in the kingdom of heaven. They're just simply investing themselves in things that will not last, as good as what those things are, like the Christian school and this church and the poor and everything else. Good things. I'm not saying don't do those things, but I'm saying if you don't understand why you're doing that, you're not building up any treasure in heaven. You're just building, you're just rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. It's better than selfish investing. Yeah, the, the world's out there living for themselves. That's even worse. Maybe even some of those things that they're, they're doing, I'm, I'm certain, I know the fact that God is using those things, even if they're doing it for the wrong reason, God is still using those things. But notice here in our passage today, here's why you're not getting a list. Because Jesus doesn't give us a list of things to do here. Does he? Let's go back to verse 21 and understand exactly what he's telling us here. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Here's the problem. This was my problem in 2018. And this is the problem that a lot of Christians are having is that we reverse this. Our instinct is to reverse this process to say where our heart is, there our treasure will be also. It's backwards. You, do you see how that works? That if I can convince myself that I'm doing all of this stuff for the kingdom of heaven, in addition to all of the stuff that I'm doing to earn my mammon, then I must be putting my treasure where it belongs. And as you're doing it, your heart's nowhere close to where it needs to be. We're missing the point. We think if I can just make my heart a little bit better, 
If I can just increase my love for godly things, if I can just serve more ministry needs, if I can just give more money, if I can just glorify God more, then my treasure will follow me where my heart is going. And that's not what Jesus says here, is it? At best, all that's going to lead you to, now it might do good things for other people. We'll just leave that to the side. God can still use sinful actions. He does all throughout the Bible. But let's just leave that to the side. For you, at best, it's going to end up in frustration and burnout. And this is happening all over the Protestant church as well. People are burned out because they've been trying to build up treasure and hope their heart ends up in the right place. So at best, it's just going to be frustrating. It's going to be burned out. At worst, what it's going to do is it's going to take these otherwise good things and turn it into idolatry. Right? Because that is now what you're trying to gain. You're trying to gain the treasure, not necessarily the God who grants it. That's huge. Now again, understand our psychology here. We do what we feel like doing. That's a universal human truth. People do what they want to do. We do what we feel. Now your emotions, those feelings, ought to be controlled by your thoughts. And then your thoughts governed by your beliefs. And it actually is the case for everybody. But if you start off with really poor beliefs, that's going to lead to bad thinking, which is going to lead to emotions that are all over the place. Here's what Jesus is telling us here this morning. When you make Christ your treasure, for where Christ is, just get rid of that word treasure for a moment, put Christ in there. For where Christ is for you, that's where your heart will be also. When you're believing and trusting in him, when you're aligning your thoughts with his word, your heart will be there also. Right? Because your feelings follow your thoughts and your beliefs. So if your belief is solid, if you understand what God's word says, and that changes your worldview, the way that you see things around you, your heart is going to follow. That's the way that God designed you to work. Put Christ at the center. Surround yourself with his word. That's why we encourage you to read it every day. Listen to good Christian music when you have the opportunity. Put Christian people in your lives. You cannot live the way that God created you to live without them. We need each other. And then make sure there's lots of times of silence and solitude in between so that as you're reading God's word, God can put it deeply into your heart and apply it into your life. You're going to naturally... When you make Christ your treasure, you're going to start to hate sin and, and want to get as far away from it as what you can. And you're going to come to believe in him more and know him more. And it gets to be a perpetual process. The more you know him, the more you're going to treasure him, the more your heart is going to follow. See, here's the benefit of this. If I were to give you a list of things to do, and you already know what's on that list anyways. If I were to give you a list of things to do, all I would be doing is adding to what you already have to do and you already have too much to do. What Jesus is saying to us here this morning is that if you treasure him, if he is at the center of all things for you, then everything you do, everything, the stuff that you're already doing, is going to be building up treasure in one way or the other in the kingdom of heaven because Christ is at your center. You're doing it for him. You're doing it his way. And you're doing it for his glory. You don't have to add anything to your to-do list. These things that need to be done for the kingdom of heaven to, 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 to be established here in this world, God is doing those things, by the way. It's not us doing them. But certainly he calls us to contribute to the Christian school, to the church, to a lot of other things in between. You're going to start doing more and more of that and not even realize what you're doing. Right? That's what the sheep said in the parable of the sheep and the goats. And you know how that story goes, that, that they had been giving a cup of cold water. They visited Jesus in jail. They gave him clothes, so on and so forth. And, and then they look around at each other at the end. There, and they said, Lord, 
We don't remember doing this at all. This was not on our list of things to do, to go find Jesus and give him a cup of cold water, to go visit him in jail and so on and so forth. We were busy doing other things, these sheep say to Jesus. And Jesus said, yes, but you were treasuring me the whole time. And in some way and in some sort, often, in fact, most of the times in ways that you'll never even realize, you're building up treasure in heaven. You've been given citizenship in the kingdom of heaven. So aggressively invest in your reward by treasuring Christ. (coughs) Let's thank him for this gift. Oh, Father in heaven, we thank you for these words of freedom here today. We're overwhelmed by things that need to be done. We have ourselves invested into so many different things. And most of these things, Father, are good things. We do need to make a living. We do need to educate our children. We do need to build up this community and, and, and feed the world here in Southwest Minnesota. You've given us so many things to do, Father. And so we thank you that as we keep Jesus Christ as our treasure, our heart will naturally follow towards him no matter what it is that we're doing. And so you have given us the ability not only to become citizens of the kingdom of heaven, but to increase our status there, our greatness there, by doing these good things that we don't even realize that we're doing if our treasure is in the right place to be in. (coughs) Father, help us to truly treasure Christ and everything about him. All this we pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's respond to Jesus' words here today with this familiar song, Take My Life and Let It Be. We'll sing four verses of it. need to do is treasure Christ more. What a tremendous opportunity we have for you this evening to come back and learn more about this God that you were created by. Now we're going to be talking about what we call theology proper tonight, who and what God is. It's really one of my favorite topics out of all the theological topics there are to talk about. Uh, And it's really so foundational for everything else that you do in your life. So I invite you back here this evening at six o'clock. But we go here now with this blessing from Hebrews. People of God, keep your lives free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. Because God has said to you, never will I leave you and never will I forsake you. So you can say with confidence, people, 
that the Lord is my helper and I will not be afraid. What can mere men do to me? Amen.